Good afternoon. Let's try that again. Good afternoon. All right. It's good to see everybody. Are y'all glad to be here today? Somebody say encourage. Then say encourage. So the theme today obviously is encourage, encourage. And we're so glad that you're here. Does anybody in this room need encouragement? Just raise your hand. Let me see it. That's what I thought. That's what I thought. Truett Cathy said one time that everybody, that anybody that needs encouragement is anybody that breathes. And I think that's a true statement. And so on that note, I want you to do something today. I want you to take a breath. I want you to breathe. You ready? Here we go. We're going to do it together. Just a big, deep inhale. You ready? One, two, three. Now exhale. Who felt something happen in your body? Like really, you know? Let's do that again. One, two, three. Now exhale. Today, you have permission to breathe. You have permission to breathe in the breath of God. We have lined up this day to be one that the Lord refills and refreshes you today. Hopefully you'll have some great encouragement conversations out in the hallways. You'll meet some new friends. You'll meet some new people along the way, some other pastors. But today we want you to leave refreshed from the Holy Spirit of God. We want this to be a day where you realize that God has called you into this ministry We've seen that it's been a very tough season for pastors. Just be candid for just a minute as if it's just you and I having a cup of coffee. If you've struggled at all over the last two to three years, just raise your hand up. Yeah, same same amount as everybody that needs to breathe, right? Well, today you have that day, and I'd love to meet you. I'd love to get to know you. We've got a great team running around here. We want to minister to you today. I've asked George Wright, the senior pastor here at Shades Mountain, to come and share prayer with us as we begin our conference. Well, let's have a word of prayer together. Let's go before the Lord. Father, I just thank you for the encouragement that we have already received from the heart and the vision that you've given Pastor Robert for this day. We thank you for the opportunity to gather together in this place and to know that you are among us and to know that your spirit is here guiding us and to know that you are ministering to us as we hear from your word and as we rub shoulders with friends and as we meet new people in ministry. Lord, this is a privilege. And so, Father, we praise you for your grace and your mercy over our lives. And we consider today evidence of your grace that we have the opportunity to pull away and to be encouraged, to take a deep breath, to worship, to to learn, to be challenged, and to soak up the beautiful gift of your word. And so I pray that you use your word to do work in us on this day. We thank you for this great lineup of men of God who have come to deliver your word. We pray your hand a blessing on their life. We pray that as they speak, that we would hear from you. And we ask, Lord, that we would not be the same as a result of that which you say. So we thank you for this time, and we pray that you would use it for your glory in our lives, that you would fill us up, that we would then be even greater servants of you, because you deserve our best, Lord God, and we want to lay ourselves before you. So we pray, Lord, that today and the days ahead would be great encouragement, great inspiration, great reminder of who you are and what you have done in the beautiful gift of Jesus Christ. It's in his name we pray. Amen. Welcome, fellow Alabama Baptist and guests, as we are able to come together for this year's Alabama Baptist Pastors Conference. I'm delighted to be able to be a part of this, and we're delighted at the State Board of Missions to be one of the sponsors of this year's conference. We appreciate the leadership of Robert Mullins and the others in the pastor's conference. We know that today, this afternoon, and tonight, you'll be hearing from outstanding messages 
which I'm sure will follow the theme, encourage. And I hope that each and every one of you will leave here at the end of this time at the pastor's conference, encouraged in your heart about being effective in ministry and feeling good as you can about how God can use you in these rather turbulent times. Let me tell you what we're trying to do for you at the State Board of Missions, and you'll see some of this demonstrated, displayed at the pastor's conference later on today. We're in partnership, as you well know, with Ministry Safe, and we want you to understand now that we're trying to sponsor an effort to get scholarship. The first 1,000 churches for $200, and that translates, of course, into some big money, but it's $200,000. We're willing to be able to utilize on, on behalf of churches so that they can be trained in prevention and protection as much as possible related to sexual abuse situations. Furthermore, we have a relationship with the Alliance for the Defense of Freedom. You'll hear a little bit about that today. Harrison Smith is our liaison. This is a very effective group working in concert with Christians who are facing some religious liberty issues. They have a proven track record of being able to help churches and individual Christians be able to handle some very complex circumstances that may come challenging religious liberty. In a day in which we're concerned about our own ability to exercise our religious liberties in our country, I think it is very important that we have someone who is in the arena right there among those dealing with those issues as an attorney, as attorneys and consultants. We're pleased and privileged to be able to partner with the ADF Alliance of Defense of Freedom. Your State Board of Missions is here for you. Tomorrow in the convention, you'll hear a report from us and there'll be a report from our sexual abuse task force. There'll be other things happening at the convention as you've had your theme encouraged, it go, coincides with celebrate. You can't really celebrate without being encouraged. And you can't really be encouraged unless you're celebrating. So those two themes stand very tall in the minds of Alabama Baptists over the next few days. Celebrate what God has done. Look back and see how God has used your ministry and used your church in such a way that it's brought blessings to the lives of so many and the advancement of the kingdom of God. Think about how God is blessing in the present. Take a ministry audit, an inventory of how he's being able to do that. Also, consider what God can do in the future and how that is worthy of celebration. At the end of this time together with the pastor's conference and with the state convention, I hope our people leave encouraged and celebrated. Brothers and sisters, would you stand as we worship King Jesus together today? Amen. At the outset of our worship service today, I would like to remind us that at the end of it all, we win. Uh, from Revelation 21, it says, Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth. For the first heaven and the first earth had passed away, and the sea was no more. And I saw a holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Behold, the dwelling place of God is with man, and he will dwell with them, and they will be his people, and God himself will be with them as their God. And he will wipe away every tear from their eyes, and death shall be no more and neither shall there be mourning, nor crying, and nor pain anymore, for the former things have passed away. And he who is seated on the throne said, Behold, I am making all things new. Also, he said, Write this down, for these words are trustworthy and true. And he said to me, It is done. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. To the thirsty, I will give from the spring of the water of life without payment. To the one who conquers, 
He will have this heritage, and I will be his God, and he will be my son. I heard an old, old story How a Savior came from glory How he gave his life on Calvary save a rich life I heard about his groaning of his precious blood atoning then I repented of my sins and won the victory oh victory in Jesus my Savior We have the victory. So good to be reminded. I heard about his healing, of his cleansing power revealing, and how he made the lame to walk again, and he caused the blind to see. And then I cried, dear Jesus, come and heal my broken spirit. And somehow Jesus came and brought to me the victory. Oh, victory in Jesus, he's my Savior forever. He sought me and bought me. With his redeeming blood, he loved me. Oh, I knew him, and all my love was to him. He plunged me to victory beneath the cleansing flood. You remember the text when Jesus said, Hey, guys. It's actually better that I go away because I'm gonna send you my spirit and I'm gonna go prepare a place for you. I heard about a mansion he has built for me in glory. And I heard about the streets of gold beyond the crystal sea about the age of singing and that old redemption story some sweet day i'll sing up there the song of victory oh victory in jesus my savior forever he sought me and bought me with his redeeming blood oh he loved me and i knew him and all my love was to him he plunged me to victory beneath the cleansing One with God, the Lord Most High. Your hidden glory in creation, now revealed in you are Christ. What a beautiful name it is! What a beautiful name it is! The name. Jesus Christ, my King. 
king What a beautiful name it is Nothing compares to his What a beautiful name it is The name of Jesus You didn't want heaven without us So Jesus, you brought heaven My sin was great, but your love was greater. What could separate us now? What a wonderful name it is. What a wonderful name it is. The name of Jesus Christ, my King. What a wonderful name it is. Nothing compares to this. What a wonderful name it is, the name of Jesus. What a wonderful name it is, the name of together by the word of your power and just like you said to the to the certain disciple you said I see you under the fig tree you see us today every single one of us and you know every single thing that we're going through 
You know the joys and you know the pain that we carry. And Jesus, today we worship you and we ask for a refreshing in your presence. We know that you are our strength and you are our joy, you are our wisdom and we need your presence, oh Lord. We're so thankful for your presence. We look forward to all the things that you will teach us and show us and remind us today. And we sing and pray together as one voice in the mighty name of Jesus, amen. You guys can be seated. I wasn't sure if I was supposed to wait until that was over or if there was some other show that was going to uh, be appearing under that credit. But thank you for inviting me today to the Alabama Pastors Conference. Open your Bibles to Matthew chapter nine, where in just a moment I'll be reading a passage of scripture that's going to be the foundation for today's message. Matthew chapter nine. And while you're turning to Matthew nine, uh, let me say thank you for inviting me today. And also thank you for your longtime support of Golden Gate, now Gateway Seminary of the Southern Baptist Convention. You have supported us by your gifts through the cooperative program, by praying for us, and by sending students from Alabama to our campuses. Thank you so much. We are no longer your small seminary out west. We're now the 10th largest seminary in North America with an enrollment of 2,200 students. We are the most multicultural seminary in North America with 65% of our students being non-Anglo. We have the largest geographic assignment of any seminary in the SBC, half the continent. And so thank you for your support of us and for what that's meant over the years. Your uh, leaders today have asked me specifically to speak on the theme of leading major change and, and to encourage you in taking on that significant responsibility. I've now been in ministry leadership for 40 years, and in each of the four major assignments God has given me, I have led at least one major change. In my first church, an established pastorate, I led the church to purchase 10 acres and prepare for its relocation. My second responsibility was to plant a new church in Portland, Oregon, which of course entailed a number of significant changes, but was also a paradigm shifting church planting effort for the Northwest Baptist Convention in 1989. And then I became the executive director of the state convention for Washington and Oregon, the Northwest Baptist Convention. And that responsibility had two major changes. One, the relocation of our convention facility, but larger than that, we, we shifted from a 1950s denominational structure of a top-down bureaucracy to a field-based strategy driven by the needs of the churches. And then I became the president of Golden Gate Seminary, now Gateway Seminary. And as you are probably aware, in 2016, we picked up the 10th largest seminary in North America. Families, faculty, staff, students, and moved 400 miles and started over in a new location in Southern California. But more than even that, we left behind 400 years of history about what a seminary campus is supposed to be like and built a seminary for the 21st century. I have some experience with leading major change. And that has resulted in my book, Leading Major Change in Your Ministry, and today will not be an entire book review in 25 minutes, but instead I'd like to teach you just one small sliver of what it means to lead major change by looking in Matthew 9 at the two most famous principles that Jesus ever taught about leading change, and just before that, three models of how people respond to change and what that means for us 
as change initiators. Matthew chapter nine, beginning now in verse nine. As Jesus went on from there, he saw a man named Matthew sitting at the tax office, and he said to him, follow me. And he got up and followed him. While he was reclining at the table in the house, many tax collectors and sinners came to eat with Jesus and his disciples. When the Pharisees saw this, they asked his disciples, why does your teacher eat with tax collectors and sinners? Now when he heard this, he said, it's not those who are well who need a doctor, but those who are sick. Go and learn what this means. I desire mercy and not sacrifice. For I didn't come to call the righteous, but sinners. Then John's disciples came to him saying, why do we? Why do we and the Pharisees fast often? But your disciples do not fast. Jesus said to them, can the wedding guests be sad while the groom is with them? The time will come when the groom will be taken away from them and then they will fast. No one patches an old garment with unshrunk cloth because the patch pulls away from the garment and makes the tear worse. And no one puts new wine into old wine skins. Otherwise, the skins burst, the wine spills out, and the skins are ruined. No, they put new wine into fresh wine skins, and both are preserved. Now, for many years, I taught the two principles enumerated in verses 16 and 17 as the two crucial principles that Jesus taught about leading major change. But I often wondered why these three vignettes were attached to the front of these two principles. They almost seem like add-ons to what Jesus is planning to say, and in some sense, they, for a long time, didn't really introduce much about those principles. Because of my high view of scripture, I kept going back and asking, why are those stories there? And really, after a couple of decades of reflection on that question, I came to understand that Jesus begins this section on leading major change by telling us three models of how people respond to change. The first is the Matthew model. Jesus walked up to Matthew and said, follow me. And Matthew got up and followed him. This is so simple. Hear Jesus, follow him. Can you say it with me? Hear Jesus, follow him. So, come on, say it one more time. Hear Jesus, follow him. One more time, are you ready? Hear Jesus, follow him. It's really just that simple about leading major change, but they gave me 30 minutes, so I've gotta keep talking. Matthew, the Matthew model is the simple model of what it means to go through major change. In this case, the major change that's being introduced is the inauguration of the kingdom of God through Jesus Christ. And he says to Matthew, follow me, and Matthew follows him. But now we meet these other two groups which illustrate two other models of how people respond to major change. The first are the Pharisees. Jesus is at a dinner party. When the Pharisees ask him, why does your teacher eat with tax collectors and sinners? Now what was the problem the Pharisees were having with this situation? The Pharisees were struggling because Jesus was changing too much too fast. The Pharisees had spent centuries codifying conduct related to hand washing and meal consumption, and Jesus was obliterating all of their religious tradition in one dinner party. Too much changing too fast. And then we meet this other group that has the opposite problem, John's disciples. There are less frequently referred to group in the New Testament. These were John the Baptist's earlier, earliest followers. And remember, this was in the day before social media and even media. And so word was traveling rather slowly about John the Baptist switching his followers over to, become a, uh, to have an allegiance to Jesus. 
So these men were still known as John's disciples and they came to Jesus and asked him this question, what is wrong with your people? Why are your people not fasting? Jesus, you need to tell your people to pick up the pace. We are spiritually devoted. We're early adopters, we bought in. Your people need to get with the program. These are people who have the opposite problem of the Pharisees. John's disciples are complaining that not enough is changing fast enough. Now, if you've ever led change in a ministry organization, you already know these are the polar extremes we encounter with people. On the one hand, some people say, too much is changing too fast. And on the other hand, some people say, not enough is changing fast enough. And quite honestly, we find ourselves dealing with people who are on a continuum between these extremes and placed on a line all along the way, and it is challenging to know how to lead forward in that context. Now you're thinking, yeah, all those people have got a problem, but not me. I like change. Well, newsflash, no you don't. The first thing this passage, uh, these models teach us is that change is hard in one way or the other for everyone. The reason you think you like change is because you typically only initiate changes that you want to see happen. Leaders are the ones who get to make those calls and so naturally we're going to lead change in areas we think need to be changed and so of course we're going to be for the changes and we forget that if we're placed in the opposite position where the change is being imposed upon us, we can be just as recalcitrant as the crustiest old traditionalist in our churches. Let me illustrate it for you. In 1973, the American League introduced the abomination known as the designated hitter rule to the, to the glorious game of baseball. Now the National League has understood for the past 50 years how baseball is supposed to be played as God designed it with pitchers coming to bat just like all the rest of the players. Now some of you think I've lost my mind. Why is this such a big deal to me? Because this is the way it's supposed to be. This is the way it's always been. This is the way I like it. And so on the issue of the designated hitter rule, while the American League played beer league softball for the past 50 years, the National League has continued to play real baseball. Is there not one Alabama Baptist who would amen that statement? Thank you. Goodness. Now some of you are thinking I really have lost my mind, but I'm just trying to make the point. If it's something that you don't want changed, you can be the greatest Pharisee in the group. And if it's something that you don't think is changing fast enough, you can be just like John's disciples. Now listen very carefully. One of the first principles you have to learn about leading major change is to stop attacking people who are struggling with change because all of us are in that group. We have to have better strategies than just attacking people who are recalcitrant or difficult or struggling and understand that change is hard for everyone and we have to develop the skills necessary to lead it effectively. And the second thing these models teach us is that people process change differently and they process change differently for a number of different factors and reasons related to their background, related to their perspective, related to their training, related to what they're going on and what they're experiencing in other places, in other contexts in their lives, while at the same time having these major changes thrust upon them in ministry organizations. People process change differently. Now there's no time in a brief message like this this afternoon, but. In my book, I spend a good bit of time talking about the difference between change and transition. Change is defined as the new set of circumstances introduced into an organization, and transition is the spiritual, emotional, and psychological adjustment people make to accommodate the change. So for example, in the seminary's relocation, when the board of trustees voted to sell the campuses, move our seminary 400 miles and rename us Gateway Seminary, when that vote was taken, the change was over. 
because the new set of circumstances had been, had been introduced into the organization and it was an inviolable new reality. Change has come. But the transition was just beginning. And in fact, our executive team went away for a three-day retreat before that change was announced. And we developed a transition plan that had over 100 to-do items on the list. Because we knew that once the change was announced, that people were going to respond to that change in different ways for different reasons, and we had a responsibility not just to announce a change, but we had a responsibility to manage the transition, helping people to make the spiritual, emotional, and psychological adjustments necessary to accommodate the change. Now listen, pastors, this is where we are unique as Christian leaders because we ought to highly value the transition process for two reasons. One, it's an opportunity to demonstrate pastoral care. It's an opportunity to step into people's lives and demonstrate care for them while they are going through all the internal trauma required to adjust to the change that's been thrust into their lives. And second, and perhaps even more importantly, it is a tremendous opportunity for disciple making. When I was a member of First Baptist Church San Francisco, on a Sunday, I was sitting in the balcony when our pastor stood up and said, our church is in the city. We're staying in the city. In order to remain here and continue to be a Bible teaching outpost in the middle of this vast city, we must have improved facilities. And to do that, we need to raise a significant amount of money to remodel our downtown city block facilities for the long-term commitment or future ministry use of our church. And I'm sitting in the front row of the balcony that Sunday and my first thought that went through my mind was, there goes my vacation. You know, I'm like you, I live on a budget. This is what I have, this is what I spend, and this is where I spend it. And for me to give significant money to a building fund meant I had to take it from something and I knew it was gonna have to come out of some discretionary line item in our budget where we were saving money for something or putting aside money for something and now he wants me to do what with it? Give it to the church for a building program? I heard that sitting in the front row of the balcony and I thought, there goes my vacation. Seriously? A building program? Where are we gonna get the money for that? And then over the next several weeks, our pastor led me through a disciple-making process. The change had been announced. The decision had been made to do this. The transition was now in place. I was growing through the process of accommodating the change. And over the next six weeks, I heard messages in, in services. I heard testimonies from other members as they were processing this information. I read materials that were provided. I went through a weekly Bible study that was given. I read daily devotionals the church was doing as a group. And after six weeks of that, I came to the Giving Sunday excited to give more than I had ever planned to give because I had grown during the six weeks in my discipleship, in my commitment to my church, and in my understanding of God's ability to provide, and I was ready to give and to be a part of the activity of God in that moment because I had been discipled through the process. Now, is that making sense to you? You see, when we introduce major change and people respond to it in all kinds of different ways, they're going through this transition process of accommodating this change. They're spiritually, emotionally, and psychologically growing. And as pastoral leaders, we thrive in that environment because it gives us the opportunity to demonstrate pastoral care to people. And it gives us the opportunity to use change and transition as a disciple-making moment. When the seminary relocated, the transition process was so meaningful because so many in our community that you would think were such spiritually mature giants, and in many ways they are spiritually mature giants. Long time staff members, faculty members. But through those weeks of transition, I was able to spend time with so many of them, helping them process, pray through, trust God, and grow in new ways. And in our testimonial meetings every month as we went through that experience together, it was astounding to hear their stories as they stood up and said, God is at work in my life like never before. God is moving. One faculty member who was going to remain in the Bay Area, he was very near retirement, he was staying in the Bay Area to continue to teach in the campus we left behind there when we moved to Southern California. After a few 
few weeks, asked for an appointment, came in my office and said, is it too late to move with you guys? And I said, oh, Leroy, given your age and how close you are to retirement, don't you just wanna stay here for another year or so and teach for us and then retire in another year? And he looked at me and said, I wanna go with you. God is on you. And I wanna be, a cl I wanna be close to where God is moving. <laughs> He was seeing the activity of God and it was stirring something within him that was new and fresh and vibrant. Disciple making was taking place right in the life of this faculty member. So, we learn from the first part of this story, or these stories, three models for how people respond to change. The Matthew model, hear Jesus and follow him. But the Pharisees and John's disciples illustrate the extremes that people will also make in this response. And we recognize that every person is somewhere between those extremes on a continuum. And as a pastoral leader, we have a responsibility to step into those moments with pastoral care and disciple making, not debating the change necessarily any longer because those are the new circumstances the organization or the church has agreed. This is our future. But now helping people to move through the transition to make it a reality. This, my friends, is the pastoral responsibility of leading major change. Now let's shift gears and talk about these two principles that Jesus then teaches. Jesus now teaches two principles that both encourage us and challenge us as ministry leaders. He uses two illustrations that would have been common in that day, an illustration about garments and an illustration about wineskins. Here are the principles. The first one is this. Real change requires real change. No patches. Jesus uses this illustration. He said, no one patches an old garment with unshrunk cloth because the patch pulls away from the garment and makes the tear worse. Now the background of this might be helpful to you because we get our clothing quite differently today. In the day of Jesus, if your two-year-old needed a new shirt, you started by shearing a sheep, spinning the wool into thread, weaving the thread into cloth, cutting the cloth and making a garment, putting it on the kid, letting him wear it for a while. After it got soiled, you took it off, took it down to the river, beat it on, dip it in the water, beat it on a rock, and do get that in order, off the kid first, then in the river, then on the rock. Put it back on the kid, let him wear it a little while longer. You do that 10 times, the garment will shrink up to a certain form, and then it will tear. Jesus says, every, one, every person here knows you don't put old, a, new, a, a new patch on an old garment because the next time you wash it, the shrinkage will not match and you'll have a worse mess than when you started. You can't patch old garments forever. Now listen carefully. Incremental change is both desirable and normative in ministry organizations. Most days at the seminary, I am not leading major change. I'm leading inter incremental change. Little changes, little adjustments that need to be made along the way. I'm patching. And at the seminary again, for 50 years, we patched an old campus. And in 2010, our board of trustees adopted a massive plan that we took forward to our governmental leaders in Northern California to patch it again. We planned to stay. But it became evident over the next few years that patches were no longer sufficient. And we picked up a Seminary of hundreds of people and moved 400 miles and started over in a new location. Listen, brothers and sisters, incremental change is both desirable and normative until it's not. Sometimes a patch won't do. 
You've gotten everything you can out of that building. Sometimes you've got to build a new building. You've gotten everything you can out of that location. Sometimes you've got to move. You've gotten everything you can out of the current org chart in your church. Sometimes that chart's got to be revised. You've gotten everything you can out of the current way of doing budgeting in your congregation. Now it's time to reformat how the budgeting is done. You have gotten everything you can out of what you've been doing for the past decades. You've patched it and patched it and patched it, but now it's time for a new garment. You say, well, I just think you can just about work everything around to a patch process if you stay with it. No, you can't. Suppose in the state of Alabama tomorrow, there was a law passed that we were all gonna start driving on the left-hand side of the road. Would you want that phased in county by county? Would you want a patchwork approach to the implementation of that new law? No. Suppose a young man came to you and said about your daughter, I'd like to ask you for your permission to, and blessing to marry your daughter. And you said, well, I'd like to give it. And he said, I appreciate that. And I want you to know, I want to give you my word that once I've asked her to marry me, I'm going to start phasing down my dating of other girls. And over time, I'm going to phase that down to zero. How would that go? Not so much. I know it's hard. I have relocated a church. I've planted a new one. I've reformatted a state convention. I've moved to seminary. I know what it's like to come to the hard reality that a patch won't do anymore. And I'm imploring you this afternoon, ministry leaders, have the courage to stand up and lead if a new garment is needed. Sometimes a patch won't do. And then the second principle. Real change requires new structures. That's the wineskin illustration. Jesus said, no one puts new wine into old wineskins. Otherwise, the skins burst, the wine spills out, and the skins are ruined. No, new wine goes into fresh wineskins, and both are preserved. Now, at a Southern Baptist meeting, there may need to be some explanation about this wine illustration, so work with me here. In that day and age, you took fresh juice and you poured it into a new wineskin. A wineskin is an animal hide pouch. You'd put that new wine, or excuse me, that fresh juice into a new wine skin. You'd hang it up and let it ferment for a while. And as the fermentation process took place, the wine skin would naturally expand and hold the fermented beverage. Jesus said, everyone knows you don't go out in the yard and pick up an old brittle, dry, cracked wine skin, bring it in the house, pour new juice into it, because when that juice turns into wine and the fermentation process starts, the wine skin will burst and everything will be lost. Now, the word structures often causes us to think of buildings, and I need you to move away from that for just a moment. New major change or real change requires new structures, meaning new methods, new approaches, new leaders, new org charts, new budgets. It can mean new facilities, but it doesn't always have to mean that. But it does mean that whatever is going to have to be created to hold, sustain, facilitate the change has to be built. And listen, this is the part that becomes difficult for leaders. It means that you have to be willing to give your life until that happens. One of the sobering realities when I was facing the challenge and choice about moving the seminary was that I had to pray through if I was willing to invest the next five to 10 years of my life making that happen. You say, well, it didn't take that long. Yes, it did. Because you're just thinking about the moment of picking up the boxes and moving them downstate. 
that really wasn't when the relocation was accomplished. You see, our mission as a seminary is not moving. Our mission is shaping leaders to expand God's kingdom around the world. And until we proved conclusively that we could do it in a new location and solve all the challenges that came with that, the change really hadn't been implemented. And so now I'm looking back over the last six years and I can confidently say that it took about four to five years. It would have only taken three, but this thing called COVID happened, which stretched it out a little bit. But I spent the last several years of my life building the wineskins to hold the new movement of God that he initiated in 2016 when we moved. Brothers and sisters, creating new wineskins is the hard work of building the financial, organizational, structural, strategic, and sometimes even physical structures to sustain the change. And I don't wanna be mean-spirited about this, but I'll just tell you, this is why some of you don't wanna lead major changes because you don't wanna spend a half a decade making sure it works. Leading major change in ministry is not for the faint-hearted, the quick to leave, are those looking for a greener pasture. It's for the people who say, this is where I'm gonna stand until we get it done. So this afternoon, I've tried to teach you something about what it means to lead major change in your ministry. Three models of how people respond to change. Matthew, hear Jesus and follow him. Oh, if it were always only that simple with so many. But the reality is, people are Pharisees and people are John's disciples. Too much changing too fast, not enough changing fast enough, and everything in between. Jesus said in that context, remember these two things. Incremental change is both normative and desirable until it's not. Sometimes, sometimes. A patch won't do. Real change means real change. And then, if you decide to lead one, real change requires new structures. Requires you to camp down and build the facility, the strategy, the staff, the finances, to build whatever it takes to sustain that change into the next generation of your organization. There is no question that leading major change is the seasonal and sometimes responsibility of ministry leaders. One, two, three, ten times perhaps, but somewhere along the way in your ministry, you may be faced with this kind of leadership decision. May God give you the courage to lead major change and to be encouraged that he will sustain you to get it done. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, thank you so much for giving me the opportunity to lead major change in ministry organizations. When I think back to Green Valley Baptist Church and the relocation to a new a campus, and planting a church that shifted the paradigm of church planting and reformatting a state convention and then, Father, moving Gateway Seminary. I think about the times I've been so fearful, so nervous, so afraid, the hours spent praying and worrying and stressing. Father, I thank you for all of that process because it causes me to be able to come today and say, you are faithful. You will sustain. And you will get us through major change to accomplish so much through your ministry organizations and your churches. And so I pray today for the Alabama pastors that are in this room. Give each one of them insight into applying this message in their location. And Father, in every place major change is needed, give these brothers the courage, the courage to lead on. Thank you for hearing my prayer and thank you for the good work you're doing through Alabama Baptist and I pray today that you will encourage them by this conference and by what they hear and what they experience. 
in this, in this event. And we thank you for it in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you so much, Dr. Orge. I just want to uh, encourage you. You've been an encouragement to so many, and we appreciate you and your ministry so much. Thank you for being with us. Um, you all, we have about a 15-minute break at 2.10 sharp. We'll start back with our next session, uh, which will feature Sterling Lee from uh, Pearl City, Hawaii. You don't want to miss that. Um, but in the meantime, go take a break. Go see somebody at a vendor uh, stand or anything like that. Enjoy yourself.